Suppose we could reset time to the start of human civilization and let history run again, but along a new course with a different set of circumstances and central cast members. Inevitably, discoveries would be made in a different order and in different places and times, and there'd be more development in some areas of maths and less in others than occurred on our timeline. Perhaps the Greeks would have invented algebra and not given so much attention to geometry. The ideas of set theory and Cantor's work on infinity might have occurred to some genius in Renaissance times or in ancient India. A glimpse of how such variations might have affected the appearance of maths was offered by a short-lived but major change in the way maths was taught in American grade schools in the 1960s. So-called new math was introduced in an attempt to boost science and math skills in the wake of the Soviet Union's shock successes in the space race, beginning with the launch of Sputnik 1 in 1957. Suddenly, in place of traditional arithmetic, children were expected to learn about modular arithmetic in which numbers wrap around after reaching a certain value, bases other than 10, symbolic logic and Boolean algebra. Such concepts prove baffling, not only to young students more familiar with learning times tables and number bonds, but also to their teachers and parents. Many parents, in fact, began sitting in on their sons' and daughters' classes in order that they might be able to help their children with homework. Through new math, it was hoped that a generation would grow up able to accelerate America's progress in technology, especially in areas such as electronics and computers, so as to outpace the Soviets. The great weakness of the new scheme, though, as soon became clear, was that it expected children to make a mental leap to abstract topics and methods with which they were wholly unfamiliar. American mathematician and author of several widely used textbooks, George Simmons, wrote that new math produced students who had heard of the commutative law, but didn't know the multiplication table. As an experiment in education, new math failed and was soon abandoned. However, it did give an interesting insight into how maths can appear very different if presented in a wholly novel fashion. What's more, just because new math didn't work out as planned doesn't mean that young children can't assimilate concepts that we don't normally meet until we're much older, if at all. I've been privately tutoring children of all ages, from 5 to 18, for many years, and I've found that even youngsters who've just started elementary school can begin to grasp ideas such as infinity, higher dimensions, and unusual geometries like that of the one-sided Moebius strip, if they're introduced in simple language and in a way that's entertaining and fun. In fact, I'm convinced that people could come to have a deep and intuitive appreciation of such exotica as the fourth dimension and transfinite numbers if they were encouraged to play and engage with such things from an early age. It's much the same as with languages. Young children who grow up in bilingual environments have no trouble absorbing and becoming fluent in, say, English and Spanish, whereas learning a second language as an adolescent or adult is generally much harder. So it's clear that maths could look a lot different than it does if history had taken a different tack. We might tend to think more in terms of shapes than numbers, or, as was attempted with new math, be more comfortable with set theory than ordinary arithmetic and algebra. Such differences might be even greater on other worlds, where biological evolution leads to life forms that are completely foreign to anything we see on Earth. In his 1961 novel Solaris, Polish writer Stanislaw Lem imagined a planet on which there was a kind of thinking sea, a single unbroken planet-wide intelligence. So utterly alien does it prove to be to the human explorers who try to interact with it from an orbiting spacecraft that all attempts at meaningful communication break down. What kind of maths would such a being come up with? It seems at least possible that an organism with no concept of other individuals or of separate things in its environment would not go down 
the route that we did of learning how to count and doing other simple arithmetic using natural numbers. Such a being would be much more likely to think in terms of continuous quantities rather than discrete ones. It might start out then by developing the mathematics of smooth functions and only much later discover whole numbers and how to work with them. Whether single planet-wide life forms like this actually exist somewhere, we've no idea, but just thinking about the possibility suggests that under other circumstances maths could progress along radically different lines. There's nothing to say that wherever maths arises it has to start out with what we consider to be basics like integers and Euclid's geometry. The appearance of extraterrestrial mathematics could be very unusual indeed. Nevertheless, the parts of maths explored and established by the human race should correspond exactly with those same parts encountered and investigated by other intelligent races in space. Our art, music, languages and technology might differ enormously, but the fundamentals of maths should be the same everywhere. Where we might see significant discrepancies is in the basic assumptions made on which systems of mathematics are built. These basic assumptions, known as axioms, are the bedrock on which all our theorems and proofs rest. At the dawn of recorded history, when people first started to use numbers and develop rules of thumb for working with shapes, areas and the like, they just did what was useful from a practical standpoint. The first person, as far as we know, to think long and hard about the logical foundation of maths was Euclid in about 300 BC. The results and proofs that he arrived at in his great work on geometry, the elements, were built on a set of five postulates, roughly equivalent to what we now call axioms, and five more statements that he referred to as common notions. Among the postulates are that a straight line can be drawn from any point to any point and that all right angles are equal to one another. They all seem obvious and uncontroversial except for one, the fifth, which is also known as the parallel postulate. Euclid's statement of the parallel postulate is pretty long-winded and doesn't specifically mention parallel lines, but it's equivalent to the statement two lines that are parallel to the same line are also parallel to each other. Even the ancient Greeks weren't as happy about this fifth postulate as they were with the other four. It was more complicated and less self-evident. The fact that it comes last in Euclid's list of postulates and that he didn't use it at all in deriving his first 28 theorems suggests that he felt there was something slightly unsafe with including it as a core assumption, yet he recognised that he needed it in order to move ahead with his system of geometry, what we now refer to as Euclidean geometry. Over time, many mathematicians tried to derive the fifth postulate from the other four, and in every case failed. The first person to see clearly where the problem lay was the German mathematician Carl Gauss. He started his investigation of the foundations of Euclidean geometry when he was just 15, but it took him another quarter of a century to become convinced that the parallel postulate was independent of the other four. At that point, he began to look at the consequences of leaving out the fifth postulate altogether, and in doing so, caught the first glimpse of a strange new geometry. In a letter to a colleague, he wrote... The theorems of this geometry appear to be paradoxical, absurd, but calm, steady reflection reveals that they contain nothing impossible. Not being one to court controversy, Gauss didn't publish his findings, although he considered doing so towards the end of his life. It was left to others, including one of his friends, the Hungarian mathematician Janos Bolyai, and the Russian Nikolai Lobachevsky to bring non-Euclidean geometry to the attention of the world. The discovery that there exist other forms of geometry beyond that formulated by Euclid doesn't disprove Euclidean geometry. What it shows is that starting from a different collection of axioms, different systems of mathematics, each consistent within itself, can be built up. We are free to choose these axioms at the outset, providing they don't contradict each other. 
and then deduce theorems and produce proofs based on them. Naturally, when mathematicians go about their business, they try to choose starting assumptions that seem to make sense and that serve some useful end. A set of axioms developed by the German mathematician Ernst Zermelo and the German-born Israeli mathematician Abraham Frankel in the first quarter of the 20th century with the addition of something called the axiom of choice is currently accepted as the most common basis of mathematics. But it doesn't have to be that way. Our maths could be founded on any number of different collections of core premises. A lot of the axioms we choose to develop in mathematics are geared to fit our intuition, human intuition. Another race of sentient beings whose physical experience contrasted greatly with ours might start out with radically different axioms and end up with a very alien-looking system of maths. That doesn't alter the fact that if we began with those same alien axioms, we would arrive at exactly the same alien-looking system. To the best of our understanding, mathematics is universal. It may be that elsewhere it is developed in a different order and along very different lines, but granted the same set of starting assumptions and rules, it must inevitably arrive at the same theories and conclusions.